So um, the bulk of the administrative reporting going into the presentation tonight is actually going to be conducted by Mr. Costa and Mr. Witt. I did want to give a shout out to the girls volleyball team who last week became the national champions. And, um, you know, tonight you'll see a number of the projects that we have going on district-wide with regard to facilities and repairs. I did just want to make sure that I updated the board. We did have a situation over at the middle school where the movable door that separates the gym into two sections, the motor burnt out on that. So we had people come in and, and be able to get the door in a closed position. And now we're researching how much it is to replace the motor, or whether they want to take the door down, put a curtain on what they have in the high school. So once we have the pricing and we have our options available to us, see what we can do over the middle school, update the board again and let you know what our options are. Um, and that being said, uh, you'll be really thrilled to see all of the improvements that we've made and that we will hopefully continue to make um, on, on our campuses. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Good evening, my name is There we go. Usually I don't need a microphone to ask my wife, but good evening, my name is Russ Costin. I'm the director of facilities for the school district. Um, tonight you're gonna see some projects as uh, Dr. Bacora said, but uh, before we begin, um, we did a lot of work over the summer. Uh, the facilities department oversaw over a million dollars worth of work uh, just in the summer alone, uh, which is a great testament uh, to the Board of Education and Dr. Bacora, Ms. Meserol for you know their uh, continued support of uh, the facilities department. So we're going to go over some completed projects. So the big ticket item this summer was the harbor ceilings. Um, the old spline ceilings were taken out. Uh, new drop ceilings similar to what's right up above you was installed with new lighting. This work became really important to do uh, to be able to continue with our smart school wiring project. Um, it's much easier to run the wiring up and over a drop ceiling than it is a spline ceiling that we uh, had at the harbor. Uh, the smart, this project is completed and the smart school wiring project is up and running right now at the harbor. The blacktop area here at the Seaford Manor School was uh, pretty tore up as you can see from the pictures. Um, became a tripping hazard as you can see the uh, grass growing through the cracks. Um, became, you know, kind of dangerous for the kids outside. And we were able to get that done. Uh, and that was at no cost for the, uh, at, to the district because that was done in a grant by Legislative Roads and we thank him for uh, his support of the Seaford School District. These Seaford Matter Kindergarten Playground, uh, the rubber surface that you see in the left picture uh, became unrepairable, uh, a lot of cracks and uh, areas that were missing. This was something that was uh, identified in our walkthrough, uh, our yearly walkthrough with our insurance company, NICER. So instead of putting a rubber down, we looked at some different options and we decided to go with a turf option. Um, it gives you a much better warranty than the rubber uh, surface does and uh, there's a lot less maintenance on it as well. I think it came out fabulous. Uh, the kids seem to love it. I'm sure Dr. the noise in Dr. Bacora's office is a little loud from the kids playing on it, but uh, it's something that turned out really nice. Another project that was identified through our uh, nicer uh, inspection was the cement work around the bus loop at the middle school. Um, what had happened was the cement work, the cement started to crack and it started to droop down along the yellow curb. So when we redid it, we redid all the cement work and the contractor actually drilled in rebar into the curb uh, and then poured the new cement on that to uh, 
keep that from happening again. These are the boilers at the high school. Um, the obviously the before pictures. Um, it's it's almost like a radiator in your home, uh, steam radiator that has these sections. Uh, those sections started to leak, and it became apparent that there were multiple, multiple sections that were leaking. So uh, we were able to repair that, and that was funded through the uh, 2021 uh, um, uh, budget. This is the pump house that's right on the road that goes to um, the football field. It became really unsightly. Uh, the wood, the fascia wood was all rotted out. Um, this was something that we did through uh, our in-house with our two maintainers. They completely scraped it down, filled in all the cracks, took out all the rotted wood. We added a composite wood up on top of the fascia. Uh, so what was green is now white, uh, and that wood will never rot as it's a like a composite deck in your, uh, in your backyard. The main office at the high school, um, that was one of the last main offices that uh, got redone. Um, as you can see from the picture on the right, it was kind of weird where there was a half carpet, half tile, and that carpet started to fray and it became a, uh, a trip hazard and just really unsightly. So we were able to uh, have the old floor taken out, a new floor installed, a fresh paint job, and we also went into that, into the principal's office as well. Um, Mr. Burson had the green, uh, putting green uh, carpet in his office, and the picture on the right is what it looks like now. I mean, just night and day, a beautiful job. This was uh, a curveball that was thrown to us at the end of the summer. Um, we had uh, the picture on the far left. Um, the physics teacher was in the physics room at the high school, room 205, and uh, as she was moving things around, there was a test tube of mercury. Uh, that test tube of mercury fell and broke and mercury splattered. And um, we quickly went from a physics room to the picture on the right of no one. Flooring had to be taken out, cabinetry had to be taken out. Um, all this work was done uh, with the consultation of our environmental and our remediation company. Um, the room is now back together and uh, completely safe for reoccupancy. You'll see a slide on this uh, in an upcoming uh, slide uh, that we'll talk a little bit more on. So these are some planned upcoming projects. So as much as a busy summer we have, just from these projects, you can see uh, we're going to still be busy. So we're always looking uh, for safety enhancements and security enhancements in our district. Um, before I get into the, the uh, picture on the, uh, in the middle and on the left, uh, the middle one on the left, the picture on the right, we're always upgrading our camera system, um, getting the uh, much newer cameras uh, from the first generation that we'll put in years ago. We are in the process of uh, getting pricing and cutting a purchase order for a company to come in and replace uh, collection doors. The new vision panel that will be put in will be much smaller than, uh, than what everybody's used to, and that vision panel uh, will cut the view into the classroom um, for any uh, emergency situations. The new lock set in the, uh, in the middle is a push button deadbolt. So that red button on the bottom, that will be in the classroom, and all the teacher has to do is walk up and push that button. You can see the deadbolt uh, coming out on the side, and that will completely secure the room in case of any lockdown situations. The boys and girls bathrooms at the high school, these are the bathrooms that are in the Renaissance, right in the main lobby. Um, for a main lobby bathroom, uh, they leave a lot to be desired. Uh, these are bathrooms that are used by our students, our staff, and visitors uh, that come into our buildings. So you can see that they're in uh, desperate need of repair. This work will probably be done over this summer 
as uh, it's kind of tough to close down bathrooms uh, in the middle of the school year. The PPS and Wellness Center at the, at the middle school, uh, this is the current map configuration on the space. Um, we have rooms in there that are kind of landlocked and don't have any windows and poor ventilation as it's a, a first generation uh, ventilation system that was put in the building as it was built. So the new layout will incorporate a wellness center for our students uh, that are in crisis to be able to go to. You can see the offices now uh, moved along the outside wall that now have windows. The whole area will have an upgraded HVAC system with proper ventilation. So we, this is the slide I was talking about earlier. Uh, we're also going to be renovating our uh, sign, two of our science rooms at the high school. The science room on the right is the room that we had the remediation in, um, and the one on the left is uh, what the current chemistry room. Uh, they don't lend themselves to a modern day uh, science room, and um, the new uh, project will, will make them uh, more user friendly for the teachers. The Snack Shack, which is uh, on our right off of our football field, um, it's pretty beat up, needs a little facelift. We were able to uh, add that into the Legislative Rose Grant that we got. This project right now will probably start within the next couple of weeks. A project for f future consideration is our uh, creating a multi purpose field at our high school. And I'd like to introduce my esteemed colleague, Mr. Witt. He is our athletic director. Uh, we we're going to uh, share this presentation with you. Thank you, Mr. Costa. So picture to the left there, like Mr. Costa said, is going to be a multi-purpose turf athletic field serving softball, baseball, soccer, and field hockey, both at the varsity and JV level. So essentially, that's 11 teams that are now gonna have a field practice in game conditions. Sure, so the next, uh, just going back to this slide, let me use this. So over here in this red circle, that's where our current varsity baseball team plays our games. So the idea is to move our varsity field over here, and then the middle school field, middle school team would take this field over. So now we have two ideal baseball fields. So what are the benefits of relocating the baseball field? Again, you have two fields um, that are in phenomenal condition, okay? You have uh, fewer houses that are in danger of foul balls in the varsity field. All your high school teams are now practicing right in their backyard at the back of the high school and vice versa to the middle school teams. You have better seating, you'll have better parking, You'll have more space for batting cages, bullpens, storage units, and bleachers. Your dugout space has better potential. There's electric and water on site there. And you have more athletes on the field space during practices. And of course, that's closer to the snack shack, which is good for our booster club and good young bees. So I'm just gonna wing it without a microphone, okay? Um, so this is the current uh, housing. I don't want my mom and dad me. That is the last person that my mom and dad is. Uh, so this is the current uh, varsity baseball field. Um, as you can see, uh, drainage is a major issue. Drainage is a major issue there. Um, you know, uh, it takes a lot of maintenance to get it playable on rainy days. 
Um, so right now, currently, the district has two grounds. And when we um, get in between seasons, so once baseball season is over, they move on to the next season. And they just don't have the time to go back and keep up with a baseball field. So the field becomes overgrown with crabgrass, and uh, it makes it very hard to get this field back up and running again when um, the baseball season comes up. As you can see, this is uh, some of the grass. Uh, the picture on the right is our in current infield. Um, sadly, uh, you know, with, with being a school district, we just can't go to Home Depot like all of us do and pick up a bag of, uh, of uh, weed feed and, and use any type of harsh chemicals on our fields because this is where our children play. So we are very limited on what we can put down on the field. So unfortunately, we do get a lot of uh, crab grass and dandelions, uh, which just you know makes our field uh, a little unsightly and embarrassing to uh, other uh, teams that have pristine fields that come to our location. Our next slide here um, shows coaches and, and uh, players working on the field um, due to inclement weather. Uh, as anyone who plays baseball and softball knows that even though the slightest bit of rain here will then cause you know a lot of work grooming and needed on the game days um, to get the field playable. Numerous times um, throughout the year we, we had to you know um, reschedule our home games and make them away games due to the fact that our field's just not ready yet, which you know we lose home field advantage with that. So that's another reason why it's ideal. So this is what a proposed uh, turf baseball field would look like. Um, so a turf baseball field uses no water, like we have irrigation on our field. Um, there's no use of chemicals or any type of pesticides. Um, there's no game, day, no game day maintenance. There's no mining of fields. Um, there's less allergies for children that have uh, any allergies to pollen uh, and grass clippings. Um, <laughs> very important, uh, no yeast droppings on the turf field. Um, there's no long hours prep in the field for spring. There'll be of course savings on paint to line the fields. Uh, and uh, there'll also be of course, uh, of course savings on the clay that's used to maintain uh, our fields and build that dirt area back up. The varsity, the varsity softball field is very similar uh, with their conditions to the baseball fields. So we're not going to repeat ourselves here, but I do want to show you some of the pictures. The difference here with the softball field is the entire infield is, is clay. Okay, so you have a lot more um, water that does, you know, that's pooling, and again, just more maintenance in that entire area. This is a picture of the outfield uh, and left field of the softball field. Again, same thing. Um, you have uh, uneven terrain out there. Um, the yeast droppings, crab grass, sandalines. And then this is what the proposed turf so softball field would look like with all the benefits as baseball. The next slide is um, <laughs> our dugouts. If, uh, if that's what we want to call it. Um, as you can see, it, it doesn't drain well, right? And there really isn't any place to kind of store our belongings. Um, whereas the slide here shows a beautiful dugout with um, storage space, shade coverage, um, and again, you can organize the space much better. Now, the spectator area here for baseball in particular is really um, difficult and unappealing. Right there you see um, a caution fence, which sometimes you have an obstructed view and try and seal it up because our bleachers are kind of right next to 
to it there, you can see the shadow. Yep. And then uh, the other spot where just behind you at the point there, we have two dumpsters. And that's the other section of uh, seating. That's uh, section 202. Um, but, uh, you know, again, not, not ideal by any means. And uh, from time to time, there's a tough odor. So this is what we would propose where we have a nice large bleacher area um, and you have a, a clear view of the game with no water. So these are the current pitchers mounds that are, uh, the one on the left is the uh, baseball, the one on the right is the softball. So the pitchers mounds need uh, constant upkeep as the kids like to dig in and, and be able to use that rubber to push off of and gain leverage as they're pitching. Um, constant maintenance, uh, you can see the divots, so that means that there's constant flooding, and constant puddling, uh, and, and clay work, bricks that have to be added into those, uh, those grooves and, and those divots. So a new turf, um, let me know, sir. thank you. A new turf, uh, so pitches mount is totally maintenance free. Um, it, it, from the day it's installed, it, it'll look the same every day. So there's no maintenance on it, and uh, uh, it, you know there will always be able to uh, to use it and play on that field. The next slide is our current backstops. Um, we're trying to figure out if those are the original backstops or not, but they are definitely um, very old and. Um, you know, not so pleasing on the eyes. The other thing that I take note of is the very short extension at the top, which makes for a lot of foul balls. Yeah. That again, would, you know, go to the residence there on Tyler Drive, right? Whereas this backstop, the proposed backstop is, at first it's a larger backstop, it's aesthetically pleasing, and from the top, it, you're gonna say, you know, protect a lot of those houses or current foul walls um, with a much larger extension at the top there. So with the current location of where our Boston Baseball uh, field is on the bottom right, uh, you can see the houses uh, that are circled. Those houses are on Kylie Drive. Um, this year we've had a broken window by one of the neighbors. Uh, we've gotten complaints uh, from residents that are out in their yard and their foul balls come flying over while neighbors are trying to enjoy their, uh, their property in their backyard space. So the proposed uh, field will have 40 foot high safety netting uh, that will protect um, our spectators and our neighbors by any uh, errant Balls that uh, would be uh, out of play, and uh, you know, be a nice neighbor uh, to our uh, to our neighbors. The next couple of slides are similar to what you've seen because it's really in the same kind of area. But the the JV football team right outside the high school in the back there—that's where the practice field is—and it's not so easy to see, but in the middle there. Um, you get a lot of activity, and at this point in time, it's, it's really just dirt. Um, and again, the, the usual thing, you know, crab grass, uh, blue shrubbing, and at certain areas, it's a little uneven, um, and at times, maybe unsafe. Same thing here, this is our field hockey field. Um, it's right in the same general vicinity, okay? And then this is what we would propose. So, between the two outfields of the baseball and softball field, we would have a, a multi-purpose field um, that goes through that area, again, serving many teams for, for the fall. Um, that entire ground would be for JV football practice, um, and then a lot of your varsity teams and, and junior varsity teams, such as soccer, field hockey, um, both at varsity and JV level. So, the original, um, you know, you're serving almost about 800 athletes, you know, on those fields.
So just to recap um, some of the benefits uh, that having a turf multi-purpose field and baseball and softball field. So it will be increased playing time for all of our student athletes as rainouts wouldn't be uh, an issue. Uh, definitely less maintenance, no weeding, no mowing, no fertilizing, um, no watering as well, sod doesn't burn, uh, fewer injuries, now you're you're landing on a soft cushion turf as opposed to uh, dirt and clay, less allergies, um, uniforms uh, will be much cleaner uh, for those of us that have to do laundry, you know that the um, the clay really stains the white uniforms. Big is the geese to turn. Geese don't like turf, so there'll be no droppings, and more teams and athletes will have a much safer uh, place to play on, and we can maximize our uh, our space and utilize it to the best that we can to serve all of our students. So in addition to all those slides, and obviously, hopefully everybody got a great understanding of all the benefits, the other major piece to all this is right here at Seaford's backyard between the high school and the middle school, you, you have what I would call phys ed heaven. Um, meaning you can go out there with your classes just about at any time of the year and do any unit. It, it, it would be a phenomenal upgrade to our physical education department, both at the high school and the middle school. And if the man wanted to take a, a walk, maybe they could do that too. So again, we just want to thank everybody here, the Board of Education, for your attention to this. And at this point, we want to just open it up to any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. still going to stay as a one stall bathroom because it has to uh, be handicap accessible. So the, to make it ADA compliant, it is going to have, you have to have a five foot turnaround um, within the stall area to accommodate a wheelchair. So while the, while we're upgrading it, we, we just can't make it bigger with the physical space that we have, but it will um, be much more functioning. Um, you know, as a, as a new bathroom. Does the men's have one stall as well? The men's has one stall and two urinals. They're the same size bathrooms? Yes, oh. yes. It just, uh, the urinals are on the opposite side of the wall. So um, that's why you get, you know, more use. Sorry to have to talk bathroom talk, but um, <laughs> you brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. You said no, there was more in the men's. You got it. So with um, the hope is to be able to start this work, um, it would have to go to SCD for approval. The hope would be to start this work um, 
midsummer, okay. um, which would then uh, make the field unplayable for uh, some of our students uh, for the fall sports. Uh, but we do have a, uh, a plan on how to, uh, to reconfigure our current spaces to be able to house them. And then that this new uh, proposed field would be up and running for the uh, spring, I guess, of 2023. I always lose track of budget years. Yep. They yeah. confuse yeah. me with calendar years and budget years. You think I've been doing this long enough, I'd be living on budget years. I, I do want to mention we have capital reserves for a reason. When we did our football field, the reconstruction of our football field, or it's really a multi-purpose field, we used our capital reserve. So once again, we can't do this without voter approval. So a project of this nature, we'd be asking the public, it would be a proposition when the vote is in May, there'd be another proposition for voters to approve the use of our capital reserve, which is money that we for the construction of this other multi-purpose field. So I just want to point that out. That is not something that's budgeted for. That's not something that's paid for directly through the 22-23 budget or what you're voting for in your tax levy. These are savings that we have that we would borrow off of or take money from in order to fund this field. That's the purpose of a capital reserve is to fund projects like that when you're not going to be going for a bond, which we will not be doing. Good point. But I assume that this will be spoken about more during budget time. It'll be thoroughly explored during budget time where we'll lay out the cost and the benefits and then we'll propose for the voters to approve it. Thank you. Okay. Present. Mr. Okay, um, now I'm gonna jump on with the physical education, health and athletics um, presentation. The first thing I wanna do is just bring a quick little note, um, thanking everybody here on the board. Um, thank you very much for serving our community. Your countless hours of work have greatly benefited the students and staff of the entire school district. Specifically, I wanna thank you for all the support with, the athletic, with athletics throughout the pandemic. The Central Office Building Administration and Athletics Department staff successfully rolled out many new initiatives while playing into scholastic sports during the most challenging times. Lastly, a special thanks goes out to the following groups of people that assisted with making the athletic experience a pleasure. The security staff, the custodians, the maintenance, the groundsmen, the specialists, and again, our coaches and families. So these are some of the <laughs> Some of the challenges that we had to go through last year that we had to tackle, and I must say we did it phenomenally well. Um, we, we COVID tested high risk sports. We had to do contact tracing um, as that came up. We created bus feeding charts. We had visiting team protocols. We had live streaming. Special thanks to Kevin O'Reilly in the high school, who's absolutely was he was amazing. Um, with, you know, with limited number of spectators. Uh, families got to dial in, and then we even had intramurals. So this is our physical, you know, part of our physical education staff. Um, again, not easy because we had to create a curriculum in this environment. So safety was our number one focus. We designed activities that were fun and safe, and I can tell you the kids at all levels had an amazing experience in, in both to help in phys ed classes. We're now entering our second year of a sports medicine class. Um, Mr. Spreckles is our wonderful teacher. It's a half year course where students are now earning college credits. Um, they get exposure to the various medical fields, understanding injury prevention, treatment of injuries. Here is uh, some ankles being taped. So the next slide just shows you how many people are involved within the scholastic sports. At the middle school, we have 20 teams um, again, this four seasons, so there's, in the winter they are in the middle, there's two seasons, and we are very close to about a 50% participation rate, which is really impressive. Whereas in the high school, we're, we're back to three seasons with a 36% participation rate, and I show those numbers because that really is an astonishing number of how many kids are involved in sports. So some of the projects and some of the things that we do really 
services of a lot of different people. What do we, um, we, we want to make um, all individuals, um, we want to make everything as inclusive as possible. So I'm making it a goal to add the challenger athletics for some of our special needs uh, students into the actual athletic program and make it where they feel you know, supported and involved, where everybody knows when their games are, and we do the special things just like every other team, senior nights, and get them on the turf field. And we've done that this season, during the soccer season, and it was an absolute blast. Each month, I move to the uh, Booster Club, uh, and we discuss um, all different things that we do. One of the big things right here, I'm circling it, not because I love golf, but it's a, it's a huge task um, in trying to have a golf outing. And the Booster Club is ready to take that on. Um, because all these things and these um, fundraisers that they do go to all the kids, and the, you know, scholarships, and sometimes you know they built us, they uh, bought a scoreboard for us, gift bags, booster club dinners. They're really a wonderful group to, you know, donate so much of their time. My thought was anytime there's a uh, there's a, an award opportunity, whether it's through New York State Athletics or Section Eight is to jump on that and work with my staff to figure out who's deserving of these awards. So last year, Vinny Buccolino and Janice Cesare, I think is how we say it, um, they would be award recipients for uh, best phys ed um, students, essentially. This is another impressive um, statistic here. Out of 15 of our varsity teams, 12 of them, so 75% of our teams, had three quarters of their rosters earning a 90% or higher. So again, we always preach, all of our coaches do all the time, student athlete, and that's indicative of how well they do. Again, not everybody gets this award at Seaford because we go above and beyond. We were recognized for great sportsmanship, ethics, and, and integrity. Picture here is our senior group. It's actually this year's senior group, but last year we had 101 student athletes that received individual accolades ranging from scholarship awards, sportsmanship awards, county awards, and New York State honors. 101 is phenomenal. Last year, um, we didn't have a, a winter season as far as playoffs. It was a really truncated season. It was about three and a half weeks long. So they didn't have playoffs in Nassau County or, or at the state level. So we jumped in with the fall and the spring. And as you can see, we were co-conference champions a couple of times. The boys lacrosse team won the most improved award, and the girls uh, were the conference champions there. Again, trying to highlight all of our teams and our athletes. To the left is um, the Nassau the Town of Hempstead um, awards for any county championship team, and to the right, it's kind of going back to the 101 students who have individual accolades to their right. The senior day recognition is something that has uh, really been built up over the last, I guess, in, in my time here, where the coaches go above and beyond, uh, along with the parents and the parent reps, to discuss everybody's individual accomplishments throughout their careers. Um, the parents get recognized because we all know that parents are the backbone of chauffeuring people around and making sure kids get there on time and that they remember everything and then usually there's uh, some yummy snacks followed by a senior day recognition. Last year we had 13 student athletes that went on to play in college which is a, you know, a pretty good number and this year it looks like we're shaping up to have even more than that. The captain's breakfast, each season, so we have the three seasons in the high school before uh, winter spring. Um, we, the school administrators uh, and the coaches, we have a, a meeting with all the captains and we discuss and we give them time to kind of self-reflect on their uh, captainship, you know, um, at, you know, how did they serve their team, what were the challenges, you know, and how can you improve? So those conversations are really important and some of those athletes actually our captains on other teams, so it really serves them well. Again, same thing, uh, opportunity to acknowledge 
various students. Last year, Sarah Keene was a, an all-star, to say the least. She actually won the top one there, the college essay contest. And then she was also a Muse 12 scholar athlete. Um, and then, of course, working with the guidance counselors, making sure that anyone who is interested in playing in college or even has thoughts is well prepared to you know, do the NCA uh, clearinghouse and understand what's required of them. This year we had an unbelievable uh, homecoming. Last year we, had, you know, we didn't have a homecoming or a pep rally. So working closely with high school school administration, we wanted to make this one of the best homecomings and pep rallies yet. And I, I think we I think we accomplished that. We, we had it out doors, it was so well received. The kids had an amazing time. Uh, even community members were talking about the music and the excitement and they could feel the energy. So it was really a fantastic day all the way around. And the picture to the right, I can't you know, say enough about that, how we recognize um, some of the students who are serving our country and their parents were, you know, glad to be a part of the whole um, pep rally and homecoming. So this coming Monday, we have our Winter Parent Information Night. This is a, a great opportunity for the coaches to talk to their players and families about expectations and we're going to have a guest speaker um, talking about on, on Monday. This will be through Zoom, so I'll get all the information all the coaches are already aware as far as, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the child um, recruiting themselves and also how character is going to shape them for the next level. And, you know, expectations that we have for students to follow, you know, code of conduct and things like that. And then the last thing we have here is as Mr. Uh, Smith will say, Oop. we have uh, our own very, uh, very own Dr. Fauci, <laughs> Ms. Burke. She is the, uh, the COVID czar and the, she recognizes um, any issues that any student may have um, as far as completing the participation paperwork. We use this new program, it's called Family ID, and it, is, it has been tremendous as far as saving time uh, with getting everybody approved. It really is, uh, it's, it's great for liability purposes and the communication is phenomenal. With one click of a button, you could message a parent with anything that might be missing as far as on a form. So that brings us to the end here. If you have any questions, but again, that message that I read earlier I, I want to thank everybody up here, including the um, central office staff, because last year was very challenging, but somehow we figured out a way to, I think, make it wonderful for our athletes. I'll take any questions. So that's a good question. Yeah, that was a, they, they participated in two sports. So soccer, they had a senior night that was on the turf field, but they also participate in basketball. So we're gonna have another recognition for them when the basketball season rolls around um, kind of in the late spring. And, and we'll, we'll communicate when that's going to yeah, be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And of course, Mr. Lynch, who is the PowerPoint Extraordinaire. Everything you've done to help us with the presentation of the PowerPoint. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, my gosh. Thank you. Before we get into approvals on the, on the board agenda, I think Ms. Membro wanted to say a few words because one of 
the ladies that worked in the business office is um, surpassed her wage night period, and we're approving them tonight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yes, this evening um, on the personal action report is the um, permanent status of Donna D. Tommaso. Uh, she has been a wonderful addition to our business office team. Uh, she is the first person you see when you walk in. She always has a lovely smile, uh, very willing to help out in any way. So um, I just want, I'm so pleased that she uh, is part of our Seaford family and uh, thank you and welcome officially to Donna. Great, thank you very much. Um, okay, we can do them all together. I'd like to make a motion yeah. for agenda items 5A1 through 72. Move it. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Congratulations. Okay. 
Um, if somebody is vaccinated and a close contact, they don't need to quarantine. So it's only unvaccinated people that have to quarantine. And the only reason why I'm mentioning that is because it is a it is an issue at the high school with regards to students. Two students can have the same scenario, say they're carpooling and they're sitting in a car for 40 minutes with a person that tested positive. If somebody's unvaccinated, they're getting quarantined. If somebody's vaccinated, they're not getting quarantined. That's not um, the core rules, that's not the different rules. Those are the rules that are mandated within New York State. And that's for a close after contact, right? But it's like a vaccinated person. If a vaccinated person is a close contact, they don't need to quarantine. Okay. Because the vaccinated person was COVID positive, they don't need to Correct. Be sure. Right, right, obviously. But yeah, yeah, yeah. A positive is a positive. Yeah, okay. it's exactly. A positive is a positive. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. 
classrooms the way we did a really nice job explaining what parts are going on in addition to that which we hope to achieve um, with subsequent budgets. And I just want to say, if you can relate to Donna tomorrow, I'll stop by, but also that um, she did get a shout out and that we're really happy that she's joined the team. Just quickly, I just wanted to acknowledge Karen Cummings, who's been around as long as I have, get to know everyone. I do, I know Kwame knows Karen. Being someone who becomes board member, Costa and uh, Mr. Witt for uh, the wonderful presentation, but more importantly for um, also all the dedication and uh, effort that goes behind each of those pictures uh, in the last year and, and uh, what we will be doing uh, continuing forward.